whether you're responsible for caring for aging parents, for family members who have disabilities or who are very sick, or you have children who need special attention and love, being a caregiver can definitely feel draining and exhausting at times. But thankfully, there is hope. Today on the Equipping Godly Women podcast, we're talking to Sarah Forgrave, author of the book, Prayers of Hope for Caregivers, Seeking God's Strength When Someone You Love Needs You, about the unique issues that caregivers face when somebody that they love depends on them. Sarah has been through a lot, both herself and in taking care of others, and now she has a lot of really great advice and insights to share. So if this is a situation that you find yourself in right now, I really hope you'll stay tuned for today's podcast, starting right now. All right, so today we are talking to Sarah Forgrave, author of the book, Prayers of Hope for Caregivers. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your story and why you wanted to write this book? Yes, so I um, have quite a journey, and if I try and narrow it down to a five-minute story, it's kind of hard to figure out what to share and what to cut out, but um, my experiences in hospital environments started at a very young age. Um, really at the age of four. So my older sister, who was um, 14 at the time, was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And she battled that for all four years of her high school um, existence. So for me, I was between the ages of four and eight. And just very close to her, we actually shared a room growing up. Um, So I grew up very close to, you know, sickness and really serious um, situations. She um, had a bone marrow transplant when she was 17 and had less than 10% chance of surviving it, Um, but she did survive, so she is um, one of the few. But um, I was able to see from a young age that life isn't easy, that um, sickness puts stress on the people around the person who's sick. So I watched my parents, you know, work really hard. My dad worked tons of hours to pay for all the medical bills. My mom was the one driving my sister three hours back and forth for chemo and away from home a lot. Um, As I grew older, I actually spent some time in the hospital bed myself. Um, After delivering my first child, I had some very severe complications, very rare. Um, But I ended up on long-term disability for a year and a half. I was going in and out of surgeries and got to experience life in the hospital on the other side of things. Um, So I had watched my sister, but I experienced it for the first time um, in that experience. But going back to caregiving, um, I had the chance to fill that role for my sister on a short-term basis then later. Um, Unfortunately for her, her chemotherapy from all those years ago had um, been damaging her heart. So multiple decades later, um, she was diagnosed with heart disease and was told that really the only chance of surviving that was a heart transplant. So she um, was three hours away from me, but I live near all the main hospitals that had the transplant doctors um, where her surgery would be. So she ended up moving into a hospital not far from me indefinitely to wait for a heart. And um, that wait ended up being six weeks which now when I say that doesn't sound very long, but when you're in the midst of it, it's a very long wait. Um, and then after her surgery, after she you know, was in the hospital another week, she came home and actually lived with my family for a month um, because she needed to stay near her medical team. Um, so I had a newborn baby and a three-year-old boy at this point um, through this process. So I was trying to be mom and also take care of my sister and help encourage her in her journey and be there for her as much as I could. Um, so I got to get a taste of that hands-on caregiving struggle, even though it wasn't that long-term, um, caring for an aging parent that we usually picture. Um, I learned that there's different levels of caregiving and they all drain a lot out of us. Um, So I've had the experience as well caring for my son. Um, He had a medical emergency a few years ago, very serious, um, life-threatening, ended up in the ER with an infection um, that took him straight into emergency surgery. Um, And then, you know, he hung out in the ICU for a few days. And so I found myself back in the hospital, ironically, the very same hospital where my sister had her uh, bone marrow transplant having to be there for my son and keep him calm. He's extremely anxious. 
Um, and all of those experiences. So a year and a half ago, I released a book called Prayers for Hope and Healing. And that is really written for the person in the hospital bed. But having been on the other side of it, I know that there are people all around that person that are pouring out, who are giving a lot of themselves, who are just under just as much stress, but in a different way. And I wanted to provide them a way to connect with God, to find hope and strength in the midst of their struggle too. Wow, that is a lot to deal with all through your life. I can't even imagine being in all of those different circumstances. I know a lot of the time when we think of caregivers, um, we only think of, or at least I do, I typically think of somebody who's taking care of an elderly parent, you know, aging parents or grandparents um, who are starting to need the help. But I love how you mentioned that caregiving is more than just parents. Can you talk to us more about just what it means to be a caregiver outside of just the narrow ways that we often define it? Well, caregiving is caring for anyone in our life who needs help. I think of it usually someone who has physical needs, health needs of some kind. I mean, frankly, last week I was a caregiver for my son. He's 11 years old now, um, but he was home a couple days from school and he was sick and just typical sickness, but even in that role, I was a caregiver. Um, I was having to set aside my agenda and my work to-do list to bring him what he needed, food, blankets, medicine, and it kind of turned my world upside down just for a short time. Um, but you think about that, you know, caregivers in a long-term situation are dealing with that every hour of every day for extended periods of time, but all of us in our everyday lives fill that role whether we are moms or spouses or um, just good friends, caring for friends who are sick too. So for anyone who is in more of a caregiver role, whether that is a really long-term serious situation or a shorter term situation where just for right now they're in that season, what are the biggest struggles that you have seen either in your own life or with other women that you have talked to? What are the biggest struggles that women in this situation would face? Well, one thing I have learned is that we are multifaceted. So we struggle with physical exhaustion. That's absolutely there on the list. Um, but there are so many other components of our lives that are interwoven. Um, one role I used to work in was working as a wellness coach, which is a specialization of life coaching. And as part of my training, I learned that our wellness is made up of a lot of different areas. Um, so we have the physical, of course, but then we have um, emotional struggles as caregivers, um, you know, sadness, depression, maybe grief, um, grieving our former life, um, anger, impatience. Um, we also have, you know, spiritual needs as well that maybe when our life is turned upside down caring for someone, we are struggling to connect with God. Um, many caregivers are not able to go to church anymore or um, they may not have the same amount of time to devote to Bible study or prayer time. Um, and then there's intellectual wellness, which may not seem connected to the caregiving life, but it is actually a big part of it. Um, you know, I remember when my sister um, was heading into her transplant, I had to go in and do training on, um, on heart pumps. Um, because there was a chance that if her heart failed too soon, they may have to put her on a heart pump. And the the instructions and the knowledge that I had to gain in that session were overwhelming, quite frankly, because they were life and death. You know, what? here's what you do if your power goes out and you need to plug in the heart pump to keep her alive. I mean, it's those kinds of things that caregivers are trying to learn and, and you know, they're becoming the doctor and the pharmacist at home for that person who's sick. Um, relational or social wellness is a huge part. Um, you know, if you're with someone who's sick, you're likely cut off from your friends or your, your circle of connection in some way. And so it's really easy to feel isolated and cut off. Um, so that's just a sampling. But I have found that, you know, when one of those areas is impacted, a lot of times the other areas have to shift as well. And so it, it's usually not just one thing, it's a lot of things kind of all tied together. 
And I can imagine with so many things on your plate to deal with and just the stress and the worry of being in a situation like that, it'd be really easy to focus all of your attention on helping the other person get better while you're simultaneously neglecting yourself in the process. Um, can you tell us just some, what are some of the signs or symptoms that somebody might want to watch out for if they're in this situation that maybe, yes, they need to take care of that other person, but they also need to take time to take care of themselves as well? You know, really any of those areas I just mentioned, if you feel like your tank is empty in any particular area, that's a warning sign. And I think we all have a sense within ourselves of how that presents itself because we're all wired a little differently. Um, but it might be physical exhaustion. Um, you know, if you, we can feel that in our bodies when we're tired and we need a nap. Um, Spiritual separation from God, you, you may feel that in your soul, anger at God or bitterness. Um, you know, I found, especially with caring for my son, um, because he was just so anxious, that um, I could tell that I needed to step away and refill when my patience got really thin. And I was allowing his struggle to, to draw me toward anger and um, frustration versus staying patient and calm. And, you know, we are all human. Caregivers are all going to have those moments of frustration and impatience. It's a natural part of it. But if you can feel that that's your first response every time, that's probably a sign that it's time to refill, that you are pouring out more than you have to give and that that angst within your spirit is letting you know that. So that's one big sign, I would say. Yeah, I think that would be really helpful just to pay attention, um, to take the time to pay attention to how you're feeling. Um, but even once you get to that point when you realize, you know, I'm grouchy, I'm irritable, you know, I'm snapping, I don't have this patience, you know, I just can't do this. Um, what are some really practical ways that people who are so busy taking care of somebody else can find the time to take care of themselves as well when, you know, it's not just a matter of, you know, for me as a mom, like I can find time in the day away from my kids. But for somebody when it's a life or death situation or somebody really needs them, how is it possible that they can find this time for themselves to recharge? Yeah, so such a good question. I, I would say start with five minutes. Look at your day and say, where can I have five minutes for myself? Because someone who is in that caregiving role may struggle to find five minutes, but they have five minutes. Um, maybe it's more than five. Maybe you could do 10 or 15, but look ahead at your day. And really this can be a day by day thing. You know, it's not like a caregiver can look at their schedule and say every day at 10 AM, I'm going to set aside my five minutes, but it may be, um, at the start of that day, when you know what you have on your plate saying, okay, here's a little window of time when the person I'm caring for might be napping. And so maybe I can get a few minutes of Bible reading there or take a short walk close by. Um, also, I would say set up your environment for health and wellness for you. Um, you're probably, if you're caring for someone, you're probably in a different environment than your home. And so it's gonna not feel very comfy or cozy or, you know, um, I guess soothing for you or refilling for you. But if you can choose just maybe one little spot that you designate as your safe place, um, put a couple things there that will that can bring you healing, whether it's your Bible, a journal, um, a coloring book that you can do just to relax, um, a, you know, a book to read, um, maybe even some sweet treats, you know, a little dark chocolate piece of candy or something that you know is there and um, have that as your safe space. Um, even if you're in a hospital room, you can have a little corner of that room where you can set some things that's your little place that you know you can go to if you just need, need a, a breather. Because the reality is, in those situations, even if you say at the beginning of the day, here's my five minutes and here's what I'm gonna do, you very well may not get those five minutes at the time you thought you did, you would. But if you kind of just stay aware during the day and pay attention to, okay, when do I have a few moments here? You know, you, and you have that safe space already set up and ready for you. It's there for you anytime you need it. Um, so really setting up your environment and thinking through your day and your schedule um, and just starting with five minutes. Um, I know when my son was in the hospital, I struggled to get away. Um, because I, I felt guilty. Well, what if he wakes up and he needs me or, um, so there's a part of it too, where I think we have to let go of, 
of the guilt and feeling like we are the only ones who can provide what they need. So there is that component too. Um, but there was one particular day where I just had hit my wall and I thought I've got to get out of this room. And so I, um, I went and I just walked the halls of the hospital and I actually found a flight of stairs. And I think we've all probably been to this point where the tension built up in me so much that I just ran up and down those stairs, up and down and up and down until I was, you know, breathing really hard and I had to stop. But I had just built up so much tension that I needed that release. And again, it only took five minutes, but it gave me what I needed to go back to the room to be calm and present. And all that anxiety and energy that I had built up, it got poured into something good for me and not poured into my son in an unhealthy way and frustration or impatience. And I love that you mentioned the guilt factor because that was the next thing I was going to ask you about too. I know just as moms in general, it can be really difficult to take time for ourselves just because of the guilt and the pressure that, you know, we have to be there and we have to do all the things. How do you deal with that guilt when it is, when that person really does need you a good deal of the time? Like, do you have any tips or tricks that people could use to kind of overcome that guilt and find, make the time for themselves? Well, I, I don't know if this is a practical tip, but one thing that helps me when I'm in that type of situation is to remind myself that sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes the best gift that I can give that person that I'm caring for or, or my children who are draining everything out of me is to step away and to take care of myself. Um, I am so inspired by the example of Jesus who um, it says that the crowds were all rushing around him. People wanted to be healed. Um, you know, people who had dealt with lifelong sicknesses and he intentionally withdrew to pray. He had compassion on them, but he still made it a point to withdraw often. The Bible says he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And if the son of God needed that, that means that I need that. And so it may be counterintuitive or hard for the person who I'm caring for to understand this, but ultimately I am giving them a better gift because I will be more present, I will be healthier, I will have something to pour into them versus my leftovers and scraps, which is basically not much of anything. Um, and if the person is old enough um, to understand that concept, communication can be really helpful too. Um, just to say, hey, I'm not abandoning you for the whole day, but I just need 10 minutes to refill and that, then I will be able to bring my best back to you. Um, so depending on your relationship with that person and kind of their awareness and understanding, that can be really valuable too, just to keep that line open with them. Can you tell us just a little bit more for yourself personally through all these things that you have been through when you have to take that minute to go be by yourself? What are some things that you do um, just in five minutes or 10 minutes to help you to be your best self again? Great question. Um, so I talked about, you know, walking, exercising, getting fresh air. Um, for me, taking care of my body is huge. Um, you know, sometimes doing stretches, just simple stretches. Um, even in the hospital room, I've done that. Um, for me, I talked about having your environment set up for success. So, um, I love, like when my life is in a good place, I love being able to dive into my really fat Bible application Bible with all the footnotes and, and study and dive deep. But when I'm on the move, whether at a hospital or another environment, you know, carrying that big heavy Bible around isn't quite, it's just not always there. It doesn't make sense. Um, so I will have a devotion app on my phone or a Bible app on my phone that I can just pull up and read in a few minutes. Um, before phones, cell phones really were what they were, even when I was going through my own medical challenges, um, I carried a little pocket New Testament Bible in my purse. It was a little tiny thing and God used it in powerful ways. I remember one particular moment in a doctor's waiting room, just waiting because, you know, we spend a lot of time in waiting rooms at doctor's offices. So those can even be moments to connect with him, but having a little, um, pocket New Testament with me, um, I, I have a Kindle, and so I have downloaded um, the Amplified Bible on my Kindle so that I can read and it just brings a new perspective. So those are ways that I can connect and read God's Word that take up a lot less space and they're usually already with me. Um, and so when I have those moments, I can open them up and do that just in a few minutes. 
Um, so those are the probably the biggest things I would say. And um, just praying. Um, Sometimes in my seasons of caregiving, especially if I'm sleeping at the hospital, I'm not sleeping very well. And I have learned to use those moments too, um, to, to connect with God in prayer. And one simple way that um, I do, even at home in normal seasons, um, is to pray through the alphabet. So whether it's um, praising God, I might go through each letter of the alphabet and praise him for something that starts with that letter. You know, thank you for being an awesome God, um, you know, and kind of just going through the letters that way. Other times it might be praying for people that come to mind for each letter of the alphabet. Um, and so that can be a way that it kind of, you know, gets me to sleep too, right? Because it gets my mind off my problems, but it's a way of connecting with God too. Those are some great suggestions. And I don't know if you met, um, Sandra Dalton-Smith was at the same conference that we met at last summer. Um, I did a podcast interview with her as well. She has a book on rest. Um, and I'll link that in the show notes as well for anybody who's in the situation or a similar situation um, where they just have a lot going on and really need to maximize that rest when they can get it. Um, because that'll be a really good podcast to listen to as well. Um, so definitely check the show notes for that if you are listening. But I want to ask also, um, Sarah, if you will tell us some more about your book that is coming out. We've mentioned it briefly, but can you tell us a little bit more about what it's about, who it's for, and how it's going to help them? Yeah, so Prayers of Hope for Caregivers. Like I said, it's um, the second book of this type that I've written. So Prayers for Hope and Healing um, is already out, and they both are designed to be what I call prayer devotionals. Um, so the person who is sick or the person who is with them, the caregiver. Um, and really, you don't have to be a caregiver in the true sense of the word. You may be a family member um, sitting in a hospital room with a person who's sick and you aren't even their main caregiver because um, you're, you're affected by it too. But um, the goal of these books really is to meet you where you are. So I didn't write it as a devotional, um, you know, full of stories from my own experiences. Um, I share my experience at the beginning of the book, and then the rest of it is really prayers that are designed for your specific situation. Um, so as a caregiver, you can open to the table of contents and say, you know, I'm feeling really lonely today, or like none of my friends have checked in with me. And there is a page you can turn to for that specific struggle. You'll find a scripture verse, you'll find a short invitation to prayer. And then you'll find um, really a deep, authentic prayer that you can pray for yourself um, in that particular struggle. And my goal in writing these prayers was to not write those, you know, classic two to three sentence prayers at the end of a devotional. Really, the bulk of this book is prayer and diving deep. Um, so some of the um, titles or situations that you can turn to are, um, you know, when you can't sleep, um, when you feel invisible, um, when your caregiver, um, when you've lost patience with your, um, with your care recipient or with God. And so really just trying to offer a breadth of situations. I think there's 46 total in the caregiver's book. Um, but between my experiences and then just, you know, talking a lot with my mom and her journey, as well as a couple other caregiver friends who have gone through long term um, caregiving struggles with spouses, um, I was able to get a really good um, variety of experiences that someone will go through. And um, so really someone could read this book front to back, but it's really designed to be more of a... Um, bedside or chairside companion so that wh wherever you are and that struggle, you can turn to the page that you need. And it sounds like with the amount of experience that you have, both as somebody who has been a caregiver to others, as well as somebody who has needed care themselves and just had all these things going on around you, I'm sure that you just know exactly what you're talking about with all of the issues that caregivers face and all of the encouragement that they need and where to find it in scripture. Um, so that sounds like a really fantastic resource for anybody who is in this situation or anyone who knows somebody who's in this situation, maybe, um, to recommend this book to them as well. But before we close out today, can you tell me if you were to meet somebody right now, maybe somebody who's listening right now, who's in a situation where they are a caregiver to someone 
whether it is an aging parent or somebody who's sick or even just a mom who feels like she is at the end of her rope and cannot hold on any longer, what advice would you share with her today? I, I would say stay present in the moment and do the best you can where you are. Um, so many times it's easy to step ahead, you know, look ahead and think about, oh, what I have to do tomorrow? What does my to-do list look for this week? But the good news is Jesus is already there. He's covered what's happening 10 steps from now. You just have to be here today, right now, in this moment, and do what he's called you to do right now. Um, so when you're in the thick of it and you... Um, you feel like you just can't do it, just focus on this step right in front of you. And remember that he's with you every step of the way. That's the beautiful thing about God is yes, he's 10 steps ahead of you, but he's also right beside you, walking with you and giving you the strength you need to carry on. That is such great advice. Um even just for me today, but for everybody. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And thank you, Sarah, so much for agreeing to come on the podcast. It has been so great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Brittany. It was a joy to be here. All right, so that just about does it for today's episode. If you are ready to learn more, definitely go ahead and check out the show notes. In it, I am going to link to Sarah's new book, Prayers of Hope for Caregivers, Seeking God's Strength When Someone You Love Needs You, which just came out this week, as well as Sarah's website so that you can learn more from her. Also check out the show notes because I'm also going to link a podcast that I did recently um, by Sandra Dalton Smith about the topic of rest that I think you'll find really helpful as well. And as always, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast yet, what are you waiting for? I come back all the time with new episodes on the issues that Christian women deal with every day with plenty of hope, encouragement, and advice for you. And I know you're not going to want to miss out. So definitely go ahead, scroll down, and subscribe as well. And I will talk to you again real soon. All right. Bye.